safe and healthy, uh, mentally and physically, of course. Uh, my name is Farah Shukair, and I'm the project manager of the Arab Development Portal, which is a joint initiative between UNDP and the Coordination Group of Arab Development Funds. We have been online as a knowledge platform since April 2016, and over the years we have been focusing our efforts to improve the data ecosystem in the Arab region. Of course, I mean, this is uh, a, big, uh, a big objective, uh, but more simply, we are uh, concerned with facilitating access to quality data and knowledge on the Arab region by enhancing the capacities of data producers and data users and investing uh, in supporting new forms of data usability. We believe that this would ultimately elevate uh, public debates on development in the Arab region and also support different initiatives, whether uh, those concerned with service delivery in the Arab region or whether those who are more um, interested in the analytical side uh, of data. Today's webinar, as you all know, uh, is about producing visual, timely and relevant data. Uh, actually more uh, more about representing data and producing a visual that, that tells a story. And I'm happy to welcome around 50 participants, some supposedly, uh, these are the ones that have registered from 15 countries. Um, and more importantly for us, participants from diverse backgrounds. So we have colleagues from um, different international organizations, and we also have journalists joining us. We have uh, youth who are part of civil society organizations that are involved in advocacy around issues that are concerned with the state of development in the Arab region. Uh, and this diverse background is exactly um, exactly reflects our target audience. So as the um, as ADP, as the Arab Development Portal, we have been trying um, to invest in producing content, but also extending services such as uh, webinars and, and workshops uh, to a diverse audience, uh, audience that are ultimate, that's ultimately interested in improving um, development uh, in their countries, addressing their countries' uh, challenges and priorities, and also that of the region. I'm also very happy to welcome uh, Lina Ajailat. Uh, Lina is the executive director and editor-in-chief uh, at Heber.com. Uh, for those of you who, do, who don't, Heber, Heber is among the leading uh, media, uh, independent media platforms at, in Jordan, but they also cover, of course, uh, uh, news and stories uh, that relate to the Arab region. Uh, Lina is also a lecturer at the Jordan Media Institute, uh, and she has been uh, supportive of data-driven um, stories. Uh, and, and I believe that, you know, we ultimately need to invest in data journalism. And it is people like Lina who can help us, you know, uh, regular users or users who are not necessarily part of the, of the media network or the journalism uh, side of things. They can ultimately pass on the knowledge of how to create uh, visually appealing and um, uh, stimulating stories around issues that are quite substantive. Um, the floor is, is to you, Lina. Just before that, uh, I mean, probably you all of you realize that we, we will be uh, dividing the webinar into an hour and a half today, and then uh, also we will reconnect tomorrow. Uh, we understand that three hours might not be uh, quite enough, so this is quite challenging for Lina. But we hope that this, you know, will give you a taste uh, of, of the different tools and the different approach that Lina will be walking you through. And this will, of course, internally help us uh, design uh, more efficient webinars. We also wanted to avoid the Zoom fatigue. You know, we have been all reading more news articles about the Zoom fatigue and the uh, over uh, abuse or use of, of Zoom and the, uh, and the online uh, and the online facilities. So we're also trying not to exhaust everyone, but trying to, to see how we can plan things better. Um, thank you. Uh, and the floor is yours, Lina. Happy to have you again.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Farah. I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, and like Farah said, uh, you know, it's actually quite short, uh, the time we have uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, so there might be things that, um, you know, we're unable to cover in detail and maybe some things we will just kind of uh, go over and mention. But I would also very much like to, as much as possible, um, you know, uh, keep it uh, uh, interactive and engaging. So, you know, I, I might be talking a lot and sharing a lot of examples and tools, but I would also, I mean, I'm saying this in the introduction, is that I would really love to, um, you know, to hear from you. So I will, uh, you know, there will be uh, examples that we would discuss discuss together, we'd look at how things can be done differently or improved and hear some of your thoughts. Um, like I said, um, it, the time we have is short, so it doesn't allow us to do something very, very hands-on where, you know, you can, you know, take enough time to implement exercises, but we really want to keep this, um, you know, to, to keep this as interactive as possible within the restrictions of Zoom and the time that we have. Um, so, um, so without further ado, I, I want to tell you what we will be covering today and tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and then we get started. So like Farah said, I'm sorry, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, um, so like Farah said, um, the, our webinar today and tomorrow is um, is about representing data. So it's about data visualization. So we will not be uh, we will not be talking about um, sorting data and uh, preparing and arranging our data sets. Although we will mention uh, some things that we need to we need to do in advance of you know any attempting to visualize um, any uh, data set. So um, so what we will cover. Um, is, you know, we were, we're just going to talk about, you know, what are the steps to turn a data set into a visualization? And how do we find stories in data? Um, what are the different types of data stories? And this is really, really important because, um, because you know, there's plenty of, uh, you know, there's plenty of, of data out there and there's a plenty of, plenty of us, you know, many of us try to use it in different ways, but sometimes um, we fall into the trap of using data just for the sake of it and, and visualizing data just for the sake of it, and, and it doesn't necessarily tell a story. Um, so we want to look at how we can find the stories in data. Um, and then maybe, you know, we'll try to have a bit of a discussion, look at some examples and see uh, what works and what doesn't work. Um, tomorrow, uh, we're going... Depending on time, we might um, start a little bit of that today, but essentially we'll do most of it tomorrow. We're going to look at basic forms um, for to, to visualize different types of data. And we look at basic forms, uh, which you know, many of you are probably already familiar with, uh, you know, bars and pies and line graphs and um, area charts and whatnot. Um, but as simple as they are, we look at when they work and when they don't work and when is it best to use something um, you know, as opposed to something else. Um, but we will also look at some complex uh, forms that help us um, help us visualize hierarchical data, uh, you know, um, multiple layers or levels of data. Um, so we'll look at tree maps, we'll look at Sankey diagrams, box plots, scatter plots. And we will look at, uh, we're going to use one particular tool tomorrow. There's plenty of free online tools that one can use to visualize data, but I thought it would be fun to use Flourish um, as a tool, uh, as a free online tool to visualize uh, data. So we're going to do that tomorrow. We're going to do a demo um, and do step-by-step -step, uh, visualization of a data set. And hopefully um, I will share the data set with you tomorrow so that, um, you know, so that you try to follow also step-by-step um, -step, uh, along the way. So that hopefully you leave the webinar with, um, you know, with some uh, concrete, new skills, um, but also most importantly, you know, ideas that you can take and, and try to implement in your work, um, whether it's in academia or civil society or journalism, or, you know, um, in, in whatever area you are. Um, so this is in a nutshell, uh, what we're going to try to uh, cover. Um, and I will, um, sorry, um, and I will try to um, uh, check the, uh, you can raise your hand on Zoom, so I, I will check if anybody has their um, hands up, but also please feel free to uh, 
to write any comments or thoughts in the chat section, uh, which, uh, you know, if I'm not checking, um, uh, you know, minute by minute as I'm uh, talking, I will uh, check from time to time. So, so please don't hesitate to do that. Um, so those of you who've, uh, uh, you know, who've attended some other uh, data visualization workshops that I've given, know that I really, really love uh, Hans Rosling and, um, and I, I particularly enjoy this, uh, this one video, which I want to share with you. Um, so just, uh, just a brief background, Hans Rosling passed away uh, a few years ago, uh, but uh, he was a statistician um, and uh, he taught global health um, in Sweden, but he also developed um, uh, interactive data visualization tools. Um, you know, he, he believed very much in, in data visualization and its role in development in particular. Um, so, uh, sorry, so let's um, play the video. Um, sorry, can you hear the audio? Uh, no, we cannot. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work tool. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space. With a bit of technical assistance from the group. So, first an axis for health. Life expectancy, 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, 1810. Here Brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Southern Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. Now, why start the world? Industrial elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! Now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over. Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. 
And there is the poor inland province Guayshou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Okay. Um. So I'm actually going to go back to this um, in the course of go back to some of what we've seen in the course of. Um, uh, in the course of uh, this webinar, uh, but um, but essentially, you know, I, I thought it's just a good starting point uh, because as we've seen um, in the span of four minutes in an interactive data visualization, um, uh, uh, that visualization involved the plotting of 120,000 um, uh, uh, data uh, numbers. Um, it, it told the story of 200 countries over 200 years. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my favorite takeaways from the video is that having the data is not enough. Um, it's important, it's very important to show it to people in ways they both enjoy, but also understand. Um, and, um, and the reason, you know, we need data and data visualization is, you know, that the, is for multiple reasons, but, but very importantly, it helps us to contextualize our stories and it helps us answer the question of, of so what? or why should anyone care? Um, and this is usually in, in journalism, when anybody is pitching a story, um, this, is, this is usually like the, the question that your editor is going to hit you with. Um, it's like, so what? Um, and, um, and that's usually the hardest uh, one to answer. So it also helps us take stories of individuals um, and show that they are maybe part of a bigger trend or part of a bigger problem or it, it impacts uh, a bigger group of people. Um, so, so, so in this case, I mean, at least in, in my profession, but it, obviously in, in different fields, um, data is important. And, and thus data um, visualization uh, is important and we'll talk about why data visualization is important for data. Um, but we have to remember that, you know, data and numbers help us contextualize a story, but, but they also need context. Um, uh, they, data and numbers do not mean anything uh, without context. I'm gonna show you an example that I'm sure uh, we see a lot of these days uh, in the news. This is, um, this is from a Jordanian uh, news website. Um, and it tells us that 15,000 uh, COVID-19 tests have been conducted in the kingdom so far at a total cost of 1 million Jordanian dinars. And this was in April 6th. Um, so what, what do you think, um, what would you say is, uh, um, is a problem with this headline. Um, actually, let me just find a way to see the race. If anybody, um, if anybody has an idea, um, why, uh, you know, what is wrong with this headline? Would anybody like to give it a go? Okay. Um, so I guess I'm. Um, if, if nobody's volunteering, um, then I will just keep going. Um, so the problem with headlines like this is that, um, is that it really begs the question, so what? Um, is 15,000 a large number? Is it a small number? Is it, um, was it conducted in one day? Was it conducted over a month? Uh, is that an improvement? Is it not an improvement? Um, the, the number really does not, uh, does not tell us anything. Um, and so, and so we go back to the point that um, that the number uh, needs context in order to be able to tell a story, and we have to figure out what kind of story um, this number tells, which is uh, which is what we're going to be looking at in a bit. Um, but we also need uh, data visualization because um, 
because it helps people understand better. Um, uh, quite often, verbal communication is very easy to be interpreted in different ways um, and can mean different things for different people. So if we go back to the number of 15,000 tests, for example, you know, it, it, is it a lot? Is it, is it too little? Um, you know, uh, what is 15,000 anyway? Like, how, how do you measure that? Um, just, you know, as an average person. Um, so visual communication um, really uh, helps drive the point down uh, clearer and easier for many people. Um, so it's a different way of telling a story. It helps readers to understand faster. Um, it helps simplify complex numbers, clarifies the context, and allows us to show and not just tell. Uh, but it's very important to remember that it's not just about creating a pretty image. Um, and, and I think we, we see plenty of examples where, I don't know how many of you are graphic designers here, um, and, so, and, and you know how sometimes there's a lot of tension between, uh, um, between the designers, at least in, in, in our media world. Sometimes there's tension between like the editorial, the journalists, the editors, and the designers. Um, and sometimes they, they, they're not quite speaking the same language. Uh, but, but the problem happens when sometimes we emphasize the visual um, at the expense of, um, you know, of what it is we are trying to say. Um, so, so we need both. We need something that is appealing um, but also that is an organized visual display of facts that respects the hierarchy of the facts, of the data, that, uh, that relays the information in a, in a clear way. Um, and remember that um, we can simplify the data, but we cannot always simplify stories. We live in a very complex world, complex reality. And I think this is also another problem with um, we, uh, another trap we fall into with data visualization. We keep thinking that it has to be simple, simple, simple. Um, and, but, but we have to take into account the complexity of some stories. And we're going to see this together in the examples that will follow. So the purpose of an infographic is to show um, a story. And this story can be found in the change, um, the comparison, the relationship, or the distribution. Um, so for example, if we go back to, um, to our story about COVID-19 tests, um, how can we find what could be a potential story uh, behind that number? If we, if we think about it in these terms, um, change, comparison, relationship, or distribution. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find, yes, there you are. Um, does anybody, would anybody um, try to come up with um, a question or an idea of how uh, a number of COVID-19 tests can, can, be, can be taken a bit further, expanded to tell us, um, to tell us a story. Okay, here's an example of how we can um, take the number of tests, but really put it in context. Um, so this is actually not from Jordan. This is from Tunisia, from our um, friends at Inkifada, uh, who do some very beautiful investigative and data journalism. And um, and what in what Inkifada have done is they've taken um, you know the which is what we're seeing in so many countries today. Um, you know they're taking the numbers uh, number of tests conducted performed, uh, the number of uh, tests that return positive, um, and but also the percentage of confirmed cases out of the total number of tests performed. So if you look at this um, visualization, it's telling us a number of different things. First of all, it's telling us that the number of tests performed in Tunisia um, is increasing. Um, we have the number of cases, positive cases, which goes up and down, you know, on In, in different countries, when we hear the number of cases only, um, we think maybe the situation is um, maybe the situation is deteriorating uh, 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 with uh, with the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. But uh, but then we we remind ourselves that you know 
it's not necessarily it's not necessarily telling a negative story because it might be because the number of tests have gone up. Um, so the number of cases alone also is not enough as an, as an indication of anything. Um, it has to be contextualized and taken as a percentage of the number of tests. So this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing the plain number of tests and we're seeing the plain number of cases, which you see in red. But uh, if you look at the percentage of confirmed cases as a, as a, a as a percentage of the total tests performed, you will see that the peak actually is not, is not where you think the peak is. It's not on March 27th um, when we had a high number of cases and uh, the highest number of tests. The peak was actually before because again, it's taken as a percentage. Um, it's, it's, uh, and as a percentage, then it's more problematic if we have a larger number. Um, so, so this shows us two things. This shows us the change over time, and it shows us the comparison, the relationship between the tests and the cases found. Um, and, and so this is just one example of how, um, A, we need to put the data in context, but also what type of story we could find um, in data. So as I said, um, there's the change there's comparison, relationship, and distribution. We'll talk in more detail about each one of them in a bit. Um, so if we look at distribution, distribution is often thought of as geographic. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it allows us to compare, you know, different cities, different regions, different countries. Um, and, it, and sometimes that's where the story is. So, for example, in Italy, the story was, you know, that uh, um, the, uh, um, the epicenter of... Uh, of the spread of the virus was in the northern uh, parts of Italy. Um, we can we can dig into even um, more interesting stories there. We we see that uh, we can um, we can contrast that with um, levels of income in Italy's different regions. We can see that uh, the northern part of Italy is also the richest part part of Italy. It's also uh, um, you know contributes most to Italy's GDP. Uh, we can see what how the lockdowns affected um, the country disproportionately over there, for example. You know, so um, so there are different stories that we can find in distribution by looking at the distribution of the data, and in this case, it was a distribution over um, uh, a geographic uh, over geographic area but distribution you know can also like a, this is a this is an example of a very very classic uh, um, visualization in uh, in statistics and data which is the population pyramid where we see the distribution of uh, uh, see this distribution of the population uh, uh, by gender, uh, uh, by sex, but, but also by um, age bracket. Um, so this is uh, for Jordan, and we can see, for example, that that really, and I think it applies in most Arab countries where um, the the population is is more. Uh, uh, concentrated in the younger age brackets and, and the percentage of the older population starts to get smaller and smaller as we, um, as we go into older uh, ages. Um, so another, uh, another story, sorry, I'm just gonna close the window because I think you can hear the call to prayer. Just one second. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so the comparison, um, the comparison is is um, one of the most straightforward data stories where we, um, uh, but like we said, sometimes it can be part of a, um, it can be part of the story and sometimes it can be the main story. So in this case, uh, we're looking at how much people in the Trump administration are worth. Um, and uh, simply, uh, this, is a, this was a New York Times story um, in 2017. And um, the size of the bubble is showing, um, uh, is showing the, uh, the value, the estimate of the value of the assets of each different person uh, in the administration. Um, and um, so this is a comparison, this is a classic comparison. Um, if we look at this one, 
This is showing both a comparison and a distribution. This um, visualization is from 2013 and it shows uh, the breakdown of Obama's budget, um, uh, of the US government budget uh, in 2013. Um, but it shows us how $3.7 trillion are distributed in spending. Um, so that's the distribution part of the visualization. But then the comparison is obviously we're comparing the different weights given to the different, um, um, to, to different departments uh, and areas of spending. But also, and this is, um, this is a great example because it shows how in one small visualization we can, um, uh, uh, we can condense so much information. Um, it shows another uh, layer of comparison, which is a comparison with the previous year. Um, and that is shown um, with the use of the colors. So we see that um, um, the color red shows um, budget cuts, departments that have suffered budget cuts. The gray is departments whose budgets have remained the same. And the green shows us um, uh, budget increases and so the darker the green the bigger the increase and the, um, the darker the red the bigger the budget cut um, so so you know so it's interesting because we can see even departments that you know whose budget is is small anyway uh, but they've seen they've seen like an over um, a budget increase of over a hundred percent so um, so we've seen examples of um, of distribution, of uh, comparison. Um, uh, this is another example of distribution, um, but it's important to remember that there needs to be a story in the comparison or in the distribution uh, uh, or in the change over time. So, um, so if we look at this, uh, this visualization, which shows the distribution of voters uh, in France's um, last presidential election. Um, so we can see, um, you know, by color, just without even looking at the numbers, without knowing that Macron got 24% or Le Pen got 21%. If we just look at the numbers, uh, uh, sorry, at the colors on the map, we can, um, we can quickly spot a pattern um, and and this pattern, you know, even though it might not be you know absolute, but but it's clear uh, which parts of France have voted uh, for the far right versus which parts of France have voted more for uh, Macron. So then we see, hmm, okay, um, it's more in the east, maybe more in the northeast, and and then obviously this begs another, this begs further questions of you know so. Um, so what is the, is, is, there, um, is there a characteristic of this part of France that might explain uh, why uh, people have voted for the far right? Um, and, and this is where we start, you know, so, th so this visualization is only telling us one thing, one part of the story, which is how people voted, um, help, tells us something about different parts of France, but, um, but then the following question uh, takes us into the, a different type of data story, which is relationships. And relationships is quite uh, tricky and something we always have to uh, remember to, to be careful about because there's two types of relationships um, when we look at data. There's um, causal relationships, causation, and there's correlation. And correlation means that there's, um, you know, that, that there's, there might be some connection that, for example, when um, uh, in, in more rural areas, uh, you know, people tended to vote for Le Pen, for example. But does this mean that um, like a, a, a direct um, absolute causation that uh, every person in any rural part of France uh, voted for Lopin. No, no, but it just means that there is a relationship. Um, and then we can also try to understand that relationship a bit further. So we see, you know, does it have to do with income levels? Does it have to do with um, uh, uh, s certain professions that people care about? Does it have to do with how people's jobs were affected by migrant workers? So all these questions about relationship 
um, you know, are attempting to find a correlation. So if we go back to, uh, if we go back to, um, to Hans Rosling's uh, visualization, that was an example of a correlation between um, income levels and, uh, uh, and health. So, um, so the expected age um, and, the, and the income level, th there was a relationship. Countries, as they got richer, got healthier, but not necessarily always. Because, for example, um, we saw how in South Africa, uh, in South Africa's income was uh, improving, but it was hit by HIV, and so, um, so life expectancy was down. Um, so so this, is, this is where it's a correlation, where it, there's a relationship, but it's not necessarily always true. Okay, so where do we start? I'm going to just skim through this pretty quickly because like I said, we're not, uh, we're not covering the data, um, the data treatment uh, part of data visualization. We're focusing more on the visualizations themselves. Um, but where do we start? Um, you know, there's different sources to look um, for relevant data. And uh, um, so there's local government uh, sources, statistics bureaus, ministries, there's international organizations, you know, UNDP has a wealth of data from different countries, um, UN organizations, but also research centers. And then um, there's plenty of reports and studies uh, from academia and think tanks. I always tell, uh, I, I always, uh, uh, you know, tell fellow journalists that um, it's very unfortunate that in, in the Arab, um, in most Arab countries, we can find uh, national data uh, faster in international sources sometimes. Um, so, uh, and this is where I think this is where the Arab data portal and, and uh, UNDP's data project is valuable because, because they have access to all the um, national offices of statistics. And, and so sometimes you can get more data as I said, from international sources um, than from national sources, depending on the local context, obviously. But we get our data from, you know, wherever we get our data from. Sometimes, in some cases, you end up compiling the data um, yourself, uh, which is not ideal, but sometimes that's the only choice uh, you have. So, um, for example, with COVID-19 in Jordan, um, the it's... It, it's um, it's difficult to, to ask the government to give us like a, 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 a table with the exact breakdown of the number of cases every day, but the government does have a daily press briefing. So, so what journalists have been doing is they're going back to these daily press briefings, you know, for the past two months and and uh, manually adding up the data um, into tables to track the development of cases and tests and whatnot. So we prepare the data, we sort the data in a table, but then we have to remember that we're looking for a story. And, and to be able to find a story, sometimes the, the data set alone is not enough. Sometimes, um, sometimes there's missing data. Uh, and sometimes we need to look in other sources, but sometimes we need to maybe just perform some uh, mathematical calculations. So for example, if we go back to um, Inkifada's uh, visualization about uh, daily development of COVID-19 testing in Tunisia, we see that uh, you, know, you could get the number of tests and the number of positive tests, but then you would have to add that column that tells you the percentage of uh, positive cases to the number of tests performed. Um, okay, so so then if you see, is there any missing data? Is there anything that you can add? Do you need to look in other sources? You have to ask yourself, what story does this data tell? And what we need to do here is to ask questions and ask questions like interrogate our data and try to come up with hypotheses and test them. Uh, so, and we have to be open obviously to the possibility that you're not always going to, your hypothesis will not always be proven by the data. Uh, and, and, and so then you're gonna have to ask yourself another question. And sometimes the data will not tell you anything useful. It will not have a story. If we're looking at, for example, um, uh, you know, is, is there a relation, is there a, a, is there a specific distribution 
uh, is there a story in the distribution of cases, for example, uh, in different regions? Um, there could be, or it could be that, you know, all regions of a country have a very similar um, number of cases. And so the story might not be in the geographic distribution. So, so we'd come up with a hypothesis um, and we'll, we'll test it. We'll test it with questions and we'll see if there are relationships that, or percentages that we can reach with additional calculations. And then we'll see what catches our attention. Is there a change in pattern? Is there something counterintuitive? There, there really needs to be something, um, something unexpected for there to be a story in data. If it's all, if it, if it all fits within our expectations, then, then really we might have to look um, for something else to visualize. So our three steps then to creating a visualization is to ask ourselves, um, what is the hypothesis? And the hypothesis will be our, dead, our headline, sorry. Um, and, and the headline has to tell us what the hypothesis is. We're going to look at examples now of, of the headlines that don't do that and they're ineffective in our visualizations. Um, and then the, the chart or the graphic that we're going to create is going to be the proof of our hypothesis, of our headline. So, um, so our readers have to be able to read the headline and then look at the chart for proof. And this is basically the data that we chose, the type of chart that we chose to represent this data, the colors that we chose to emphasize different aspects of the data, and what the main points of the data are. But then what does this chart tell us? This is step three, and it's very, very important, which is the labels and the descriptions, the sources. Um, we, we tend to think sometimes that just because it's called data visualization, that the visuals have to do all the work, but the visuals do not work effectively without the text that goes with them, without not just the headline, but the descriptions and the labels and the sources. So let's look at a few examples. Um, here's an example of a poor headline. Um, uh, it, for those who don't speak Arabic, it just simply says, um, ICU admissions in Spain by age, and this is for COVID-19 cases. Um, so we look and we see that um, the, uh, the number of ICU admissions goes up by age bracket until uh, the age bracket 70 to 79, and then it drops for 80 to 89. Um, and the headline just says, uh, ICU admissions by age in Spain. So, how would you rewrite this headline? Can you maybe make some uh, suggestions? I can't see the chat box actually. Um, oh, there it is, sorry. Um, okay, I would like, okay, I would like each one of you to just, just take, a minute, thirty seconds, and think of um, and and think of uh, um, how you would rewrite this headline. Sorry, I wasn't checking the chat box before, but I am now. Okay. Um, anyone has any suggestions? Um, so Hala, Hala uh, you're saying, um, I don't know if you're making this comment about this one or, no, it's probably about a previous uh, visualization. We don't know what the percentage of the total population is. Um, that's, um, that's a step forward, but let me just give you more clues. Um, try to rewrite the headline um, Try to rewrite the headline in a way where it is a complete sentence. So it's, you know, it has, uh, has a subject and a verb or, uh, or an Arabic uh, uh, so, so that it is a complete sentence that tells us something. So for example, if you're saying, الفئة العمرية الأكثر تضرراً في إسبانيا, 
um, the age group uh, uh, most severely hit in Spain. Uh, how, how would you just add, add something to this headline to make it more complete? I mean, the question is to Basel, but also to everybody else, or if anybody else has another suggestion. Um, yeah, the admission to ICU uh, increases with age in Spain. أكثر من ستين بالمئة من السكان الذين تم إدخالهم إلى العناية المركزة فوق الخمسين. So we're heading now in the direction where we need to be heading, which is um, uh, which is that we want to ha try to have a complete sentence. So, for example, Layal's suggestion um, uh, and Anthony's suggestion uh, both tell us something concrete. The admission to ICU increases uh, with age in Spain. Or um, Anthony's suggestion, كبار السن في إسبانيا أكثر عرضة لدخول العناية الحديثة. Um, Farah went even a bit further and did some math and found that um, more than 60% of uh, people admitted to ICU were above the age of 50. And in response to Usama, yes, it is because of COVID-19 um, and, and should be clarified in the, in the headline. But if you, so basically, if you look at this, you see that um, it's not, I mean, even if the, the chart clearly tells us that uh, the number of I ICU admissions increases with age, uh, but the headline has to say that. The headline has to say either um, people above 70 are most likely to be admitted to ICU in Spain, or um, you know, 60% of ICU admissions are for people above 50, or um, uh, uh, or um, older people are uh, more likely to um, uh, to uh, to have severe uh, cases of COVID-19 because severity is connected to ICU admissions. Um, Olga is saying that I believe that the, the data chosen for this graph is incomplete. I would suggest that we add data to indicate how many of those had previous diseases versus those who are healthy. And this is also an important question which takes us back, thank you Olga, which takes us back to um, to the previous um, uh, slide, which is, is there any missing data that we can add? How can we tell a more complete story? Um, so, so, so that it's not enough to just maybe look at age. Maybe we look at age and ICU admissions, but we also look at you know what they're calling now uh, uh, the comorbidities or uh, what are uh, uh, percentages of you know people with other um, illnesses that have been admitted to the ICU. I will say there's also another interesting um, observation we can make from this data, which tells a different story. I don't know if anybody um, if anybody can can tell us what uh, what that might be. Um, there's the under 19 story, yes, Farah, um, but there's also the above 80 story because it's interesting, I mean, it's interesting, it's heartbreaking uh, that, uh, yes, ICU admissions increase with age, but when we see this sharp drop um, uh, for those who are above 80, um, this this does, this is not telling us that people above eighty are less likely to need ICU care. It it sadly tells us that um, this was um, this data was um, from the Spanish Ministry of Health up until uh, March 29th, 2020. So it was in the peak of the pandemic in Spain, and it it possibly tells us that uh, because they've had to make difficult decisions because ICU beds were not enough and um, they have to prioritize who to give ICU beds um, to. So it is possible that people above 80 were not prioritized um, for ICU beds. So that's, that's a different, that could be a different angle altogether that we, uh, that we would maybe focus on or attempt to tell in our um, headline. 
Here's another uh, data uh, visualization from the United States this time, and um, with a headline that I would like you to try to rewrite also. So if you look, um, uh, the headline here tells us that this, this is the COVID-19 deaths per 100,000 people for each um, ethnic group. Uh, in the U.S. reported until May 19th, which is a few days ago. Um, so there's indigenous, Asian, um, black, Latino, white, and um, and this is, um, but this is the average of all deaths with a known uh, race. So how would you um, rewrite this headline? You can think about it for a minute and then maybe type it in the chat box or... So remember, the idea is for the headline um, to articulate the hypothesis that the, that the data visualization proves. Um, so Fatima, Fatima is saying um, COVID-19 deaths, um, but let's try to take it a bit further. W what about those COVID-19 deaths? Death rates are the highest amongst um, the black population in the United States, Leal. People with black ethnicity are at higher risk of dying from COVID-19. Anthony, um, um, excellent, that's not fantastic, uh, the head, uh, what the headline tells us, but that's an excellent headline. Um, and this is exactly what the story that the da this data tells us. This data is telling us that, um, uh, that um, African-Americans are, are dying uh, of COVID-19 a lot more than every other ethnicity, um, that COVID-19 affects um, um, African Americans uh, more than it does others. And we can see this from the data. And by the way, this is where, um, this is where the percentage is very important because sometimes if you look at it in absolute numbers, it might not necessarily be higher, but then if you take it as a percentage of uh, per 100,000 people, then we see that it is significantly higher, um, uh, significantly higher for uh, African Americans. Um, but then also, um, Okay, I'm gonna read some of the other uh, comments. Olga saying, again, we don't have the complete story. Maybe they die because they don't have access to healthcare. No, exactly. So this is, um, so this is where the data tells us a story, but it's not necessarily, um, uh, but it's not enough to tell the whole story. Um, and this is where looking for, this is where sometimes, you know, there is a hypothesis and the, the, the data set proves the hypothesis. It tells us that, yes, you know, um, African-Americans are uh, at a higher risk of dying from COVID-19. But the question is why, right? And so this is where we need, um, this is where we need more data. And this is where we need to start to articulate, you know, other hypotheses. So, so Olga saying, for example, maybe they don't have access to healthcare. So, so in this case, what we would do is we would try to get the geographic mapping of the uh, uh, COVID nineteen mortalities, and uh, then we would try to see is there a relation, is there a correlation between what neighborhood you're in, what um, access you have to healthcare, with uh, your risk of dying from COVID-19. Uh, maybe we try to see um, uh, to see COVID-19 mortalities and and visualize them in relation to uh, whether or not people have health insurance, for example. Uh, whether uh, maybe we maybe we try to look at um, one of the things that have come up with COVID-19, for example, is that people with diabetes and hypertension are at a higher risk. So maybe what we need to look for in data is the prevalence of diabetes and hypertension 
amongst different ethnic groups in the United States, for example. Um, so, so Anthony's saying here that the reasons should be explained um, in, um, in, the, in the text, in the article, in the social media post or the blog post. That's true. So sometimes your, your visualization is your starting point and then your, the story that goes with it is the chance to, to dig deeper and elaborate. But I would also say that you can, you can also you can also go further with the visualization. So you can do multiple visualizations that complement each other. Sorry, Farah, please go ahead. Um, I cannot hear you. Sorry, yeah. I noticed that there are a few comments uh, on missing data or not having enough information. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a question to you, Lina, because I've noticed that in the media, I mean, the media very rarely highlights the issue of, of data and availability and missing data in terms of visualizing and visualization. So at, at ADP, we have a section where uh, users can generate reports on data availability. So we do say, for example, that Jordan, that, you know, for Jordan, 40% of data that uh, relates to SDGs indicators are not available. Um, mm. But I mean, we've noticed that this is, you know, this piece of information is not even considered information uh, that is worth visualizing by, mm. by journalists. Mm. No, it's, you're absolutely right. Um, and this is a problem that uh, the missing data is, is very much a part of the story. And sometimes the absence of the data is the story, you know, um, uh, because, because, because data also, I think, I mean, you know, we're in a webinar talking about data visualization, but I feel one of the things we need to import, and, you know, we're talking about the importance of data, but I think we always have to remind ourselves that, that data sometimes can be um, a tool of, uh, of power. I mean, in those who have the data or have access to the data or have, or have the ability to withhold the data, you know, can, um, it, 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 there is a disproportionate power there uh, that we have to be aware of, you know, um, and, and, and yes, has to be mentioned in the story. Um, I think, and, and there are ways to mention it, which is why um, if we go back, sorry, if we go back to when we look at the three steps of data visualization, um, we have, sorry, um, we, we have the hypothesis, which is a headline, and we have the chart, the, the, in, the infographic that proves uh, what we're, you know, the hypothesis that we're trying to make, but, but then the, the, the accompanying text is so important, as in, and I don't mean here the blog post or the article or whatever, I mean the text that is part of the infographic, the labels, the description, the sources, and is it multiple sources or one source, and what is missing in this data, uh, or what, you know, uh, what was unavailable, or what did we have to get from somewhere else, um, has to be included. Um, okay, let's try another headline. Um, this is also part of the same story, which is looking at uh, uh, we're looking at uh, COVID nineteen deaths uh, by ethnicity. But but here's something interesting with the African American, the Black population. Um, the the it was very very clear that the number of mortalities is is higher than everybody else, but. Um, and then with indigenous, um, it's actually it's actually not even there for some reason the yellow. Um, but if if you look at uh, the mortalities in the indigenous population in the U.S., you'll find that even though the um, the percentage is very small, the percentage of the overall population, uh, sorry, you'll find that even though the number of deaths is small, so for example, in New Mexico, you had 147 deaths amongst the indigenous population. Um, so as a percentage, um, it, it might be small, but um, to be able to put this number in context, we compare it, um, 
we, we, we see how it compares as a percentage of deaths in this state with the percentage of the indigenous uh, population out of the total population in this state. So we, we find that there is, it's very, very disproportionate. Um, you see, for example, um, that uh, indigenous population makes up 53.3% of deaths in New Mexico, uh, but they are only 8.8% of the population. Um, same in Arizona. They are 3.9% of the population, but they make up 21% of the deaths. So, so this is so this visualization here tells us a different kind of story. We're, tomorrow we're going to talk more about this particular kind of visualization, which we call a dot plot, which we usually uh, we use to show um, uh, to to show a range. Or you know, here we see the difference between what what their percentage is of the population versus what their percentage is of the total um, COVID-19 deaths. But how would we rewrite this headline? Instead of it being indigenous Americans, percent of COVID-19 deaths and population through May 19, 2020, which does not really tell us what the visualization is saying. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to come back to your comment, Fatima, about having a story first and then going and finding the data for it. Um, but can, can somebody suggest an alternative headline here? Anyone? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think of the headline and just grab a bottle of water. Okay, two seconds. Okay, so this could be something like um, indigenous Americans disproportionately at, at a disproportionate risk of dying from COVID-19. Or, you know, something along those lines, something that tells us that um, there, there, is, there is something here that is counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, it, it, the, the mortalities are not evenly distributed by percentage of population. Um, and this, this takes us back to Olga's question, which is, there's missing data. What could the reason be? Is it access to healthcare? Is it... Um, uh, existing medical conditions? Is it, you know, what, what could that correlation be? Uh, but, okay, so Lily is proposing uh, indigenous people are at disproportionately higher risk of dying compared to their percentage in the population. So this is a perfect headline that really tells the reader um, what to look for when they look at this um, visualization. And, and it's actually a good thing to tell them exactly what to look for. And going back to what I was saying about the power in data that, you know, whether we like it or not, sometimes, you know, we're going to use data to prove the hypotheses that we, um, that we want to prove. Uh, and sometimes that's problematic, obviously, because we, you might be ignoring other data that maybe tells a different story. But for example, um, you know, again, going back to Hans Rosling, you know, his, his title or his hypothesis was, which he articulated in the end, he said, you know, despite the enormous inequalities, um, you know, there's a clear trend uh, uh, that, that the, the gap, the historic gap between countries can be closed with uh, aid, trade, green technology and peace, you know, that maybe that's, that's one hypothesis that the data, his data was you know, somewhat proving, but then somebody else can come up with other data and say, no, the gap is widening. So, um, and there's nothing we can do about that, unfortunately. Um, I think to treat data like absolute, um, like absolute um, truth is, is problematic because it, it isn't, it can be contextualized differently, uh, obviously. Okay, so let's, look at this example i'm actually going to give you take a few minutes 
each person um, to look at this example and um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to say why this what works or doesn't work in this infographic um, and then we're going to try to find a story somewhere in this infographic um, so i'm going to I'm going to stop talking for a bit because I feel like, uh, you know, with a lot of text and a lot of numbers, it's just good to pause and uh, and take a look at it. I'm just going to explain a couple of things because, um, you know, again, we're staying with the theme of COVID-19 and uh, what they call comorbidities or uh, diseases that increase your risk. This one in particular looks at kidney disease. So uh, looking at, so AKI is acute um, kidney infection, um, and then comorbidities is cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, so I apologize if it's a lot of uh, medical terms. It, we don't have to understand, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but you know, we, we don't have to get into the details of all of them, but let's try to look at this visualization and see what works, what doesn't, and how how we can make it work better. Oh, and CRRT is the is a uh, medical term for uh, kidney dialysis. So yeah, I agree that the story is not clear at all. Um, and there's a lot of medical terminology, so obviously not very useful for us as general readers. Um, but, but in terms of visualization, what else do you think is, uh, is a problem or not working with this visualization? Mohammed saying that it's, it's too much information. Um, and Alessandra saying it's too many pieces, uh, of info for one, uh, infographic. Um, Basil saying that this is uh, useful for doctors, but not for the public. Um, I would argue that it's also not very useful for doctors. Um, who is the target audience? That's a very, very important question. Okay, so Stephanie is uh, Stephanie is is getting into you know the the, the details of something that is uh, not working. So let's. Um, Let's look at that uh, section, for example, and, and use it and use Stephanie's remark uh, to talk about different things that make this infographic not work. First of all, um, like many of you said, uh, that there isn't one story that this infographic is trying to tell. It's trying to tell us so many different things and maybe possibly so many different stories, uh, too many messages, exactly. This is, um, so, so what Stephanie's saying, and what a number of you have said, is that it's, it's too many messages. So it takes us back to what we were saying is our very first step in creating an infographic, which really is to think of our headline. And I, I mean, I know this sounds like very, very simple and basic, but honestly, I cannot emphasize it enough. Before you start designing your infographic, you have to ask yourself, what your headline is and you have to write that headline down and it has to be very clear because once you do that it just makes everything else so much simpler here in this case um there could be sorry there could be so many different uh possibilities for headlines and so you know so so it's so that's 
the first problem that, you know, there isn't one story. And then the second problem is what, um, w sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. W Wirad, Wirad, Wirad. Um, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, the, the numbers are not organized in a comparative way. Exactly. So what we see here is just numbers. Uh, 29%, 0. 0.8 to 17%, 63%, 8, 8.3%. It's just numbers that are not contextualized in a comparative way or in a relational way or in a distributive way. So, so we go back and, you know, to our first point, which is, um, you know, we have to put these numbers in context. So what Stephanie was proposing, for example, is taking this tiny little section here, which looks at your urinary abnormalities uh, in COVID-19 patients. So if we were doctors or medical students, or if we were interested in this particular scientific bits of information, it would actually be very interesting to see what is the biggest abno urinary abnormality in COVID-19 patients. Um, and the problem with just listing the abnormalities and having writing down the number next to it is that this is not a visualization. This does not translate the number um, visually so that we can read it visually. We have to actually read it numerically and like we have to read the, uh, the text that's written. So this could have been, as Stephanie says, um, uh, a bar chart, which we will talk uh, a bit more about tomorrow. Um, and exactly, they're not even listed in order. So if it's a if it's a bar uh, a bar graph that uh, lists them from the higher to the lower, then a person who's interested, again, if somebody is interested in the medical details, they will look at it and they will say, oh, proteinuria is the highest. Um, is the most common abnormality in COVID-19 patients. Um, so, uh, so this is one thing, you know, where everywhere here, it's just creating icons and throwing in numbers and text. This is not what data visualization is. Data visualization has to translate the number into, um, into a visual element. And we look at uh, we look now at different possibilities of how do you translate numbers visually. So it could be the length of a bar. It could be the size of a circle. It could be the intensity of a color. But it has to be something visual. Um, the second thing is, um, like, like we said earlier, um, is, you know, the important thing, the important question that Farah asked, who is the target audience? I have to figure out who my audience is and I have to figure out what it is I'm trying to tell them. Um, this could be a medical journal and my audience is doctors who are interested in knowing, you know, uh, uh, these uh, like medical details, but it could also be a general audience that would also be interested in knowing that, um, that COVID-19 affects your kidneys or if you have kidney disease, um, it can create more complications for you uh, or it can get worse. Um, actually, if you look at recent stories, for example, it tells you that a lot of people who go into the ICU with COVID-19 who don't have kidney, kidney problems leave with kidney problems, who, who did not have to do dialysis before, have to do dialysis after they, um, after they recover from COVID-19. So, so we can rewrite that story, obviously, for a general audience, but we have to decide who the audience is and decide what it is we want to tell them. And, and then see how we can translate it uh, visually. Um, so, so to talk about, we have just a few minutes uh, left today, so I'm, uh, and it's just a perfect place to stop um, before we come back tomorrow. Um, so let's just think together again of Hans Rosling's visualization, which was 200 countries in 200 years, and looking at um, health and income data. Um, so. If we ask ourselves what are the variables that he was working with? So we have, we actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of variables. There's the life expectancy, there's the income per person, and this is defined per country, so we have a different countries. 
but we don't just have the different countries. We also have these countries divided by region, because if you recall, um, there were, uh, we could also see a trend in the geographic distribution. Uh, so, you know, at a time when uh, Europe and, and North America were making strides forward, um, Asia and Africa were still in the in the poor and, and in, the, in the poor and sick corner uh, of the of the of the plot of the graph. Um, so the region is also was also part of the variables he was trying to highlight. Then there's the population. Um, which he showed us, if you see here, the size of the country bubble was showing the size of the population. So it was important in also just, just by looking at the graph, seeing you know, bigger countries and the smaller countries. So a country like Luxembourg is like the wealthiest and healthiest, but it's like very, very tiny. Um, and then time, you know, the span of 200 years. So, so what, is, what, what is important here is that um, is that Rosling found a way to visually translate each one of these variables. So, so if we think about how they were um, translated, uh, I will, um, I think by tomorrow I will share, sorry, Alessandro is asking if we can uh, share the link of the video. Um, and Osama shared it, thank you very much. But I will share with you tomorrow the, um, the entire presentation, uh, the PDF, so you can keep it for your reference. Um, um, but basically, um, we have two axes, X and Y, and life expectancy, um, we had life expectancy lifespan on the Y axis, um, 25 years, 50 years, 75 years. We have the income per person on the X axis, um, and then uh, the, each, each bubble represents a country. Um, the color of the bubble represents the region. So, you know, so countries of, uh, you know, so, so, um, so red, for example, was Asia, uh, blue was Africa, etc. cetera. Um, the size of the country bubble, the size of the bubble shows the size of the population, as we said. And then that leaves us with um, time. And this is an example of where you really cannot translate all the variables visually in one uh, still image. It's just not possible and you have to make choices. And in this case, um, in order to compare or show the relationship, the correlation between uh, lifespan and income, so putting them on the x and the y axis, that left us with no choice but to use the interactive uh, element to, uh, uh, to translate time. So each, each image represents one year, but then the change over time is represented through the, um, is represented when we hit play or through the interactive uh, uh, element of the infographic. Um, and, and so these, I mean, this is obviously an example of, um, of a very large data set with a large number of variables that we're trying to visualize. We're talking about six different uh, variables. Oftentimes, we find that we have to visualize a smaller number of uh, variables. But what we're going to see tomorrow with uh, a tool like Flourish is, you know, what are the different possibilities that, you know, that allow some level of interactivity um, for us to be able to translate those variables visually. Uh, but like um, Stephanie said, you can find um, Hans Rosling's work in particular on gapminder.org, which, which he developed. Um, and so it, it's not a visualization tool that allows you to, to visualize all kinds of different data sets, but, but particular, um, there's particular templates that work for uh, different kinds of, I would say, development data. There's a lot of uh, public health data on the Gapminder website, but also uh, other, um, other SDG and development related uh, data. So tomorrow what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to pick the right form, the right shape, to, uh, to, to, to visualize um, certain types of data based on what type of story we're telling, if it's a distribution or a comparison or a relation, correlation. Um, this 
uh, this form that we were looking at is, is the scatter plot. So it's one of the more complex forms. Um, we're going to look at scatter plots tomorrow in addition to some other complex forms, but we'll also take a quick look at some of the basic forms. I know they, uh, many of you are probably already familiar with them, so we're, we won't spend um, too much time on them, but we will go over them. And to, to, to look at, I know they sound really simple sometimes, but there are many common mistakes in utilizing these forms. So we look at when to use them and when not to use them. Um, but I'm going to stop here today. Um, I know we're I know we're just at uh, it's it's one thirty here now. Not so supposed to end here. But if anybody has any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, if anybody has any comments, thank you, Fatima, and thank you, everyone. But if anybody has any questions, I'm around for. Uh, uh, I'll be around for some uh, a few minutes to um, to answer, and I look forward to having you um, all on board uh, tomorrow, so we can get a bit more hands on. Yay! Thanks, Stephanie. I'm thank you, Lina, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I just wanted to thank Yasmin uh, Kuju from the team. She has been leading uh, on this webinar, so thank you, Yasmin, for your efforts. Thank you, Yasmin, and yeah. thank you, Farah, and thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And uh, like I said, I will, um, tomorrow, uh, when we finish the session, I will um, send the PDF to Yasmin and Farah and uh, the UNDP team so they can share with all of you. And we also recorded uh, today's webinar and tomorrow. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.